Tayyib Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in So this is the second session where we're discussing the opening story or the first story mentioned in the Surah Al-Kahf uh, the 18th chapter of the Quran and that story is about the sleepers of the cave but we'd also mentioned last week that the first 10 chapters the first 10 ayat of this surah are very very important and the importance lies in what? the first 10 ayat of this surah the importance lies in what? who knows? yes very good, excellent protecting you from the Dajjal the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he told us that whoever memorizes these verses or recites them when a Dajjal comes the Dajjal will be unable to overcome him they will serve to protect him against the Dajjal what other great virtues are of this surah that we talked about last week of, these, of this surah in general that we talked about last week yeah okay but just in terms of virtues virtues for Dail exactly it's a light it's a light from one Jummah to the next Jummah and it will serve as a light on the last day as well Okay, so the verse, the first ten, the first eight verses, which we're going to end up uh, end today, inshallah, we'll read them quickly first. So, Awwadu billahi sami alim min al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah al-ladi anzala ala abdhi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu awaja. All praise, all gratitude, is due to Allah, who revealed the book to His servant, and do not make it crooked in any way. Qayyiman, instead making it unerringly straight, perfectly straight. لِيُنْذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا مِنْ لَدُنْهُ That he might give warning of severe punishment from him. وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ أَنَّ لَهُمْ أَجْرًا حَسَنًا And to give good news to the believers who work righteous deeds, that they will have an excellent reward. مَا كِثِينَ فِيهِ أَبَدًا Staying in it forever. وَيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا And to warn those who say, Allah has taken a son. مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ وَلَا لِآبَائِهِمْ They have no knowledge of this, nor had their fathers. كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا A monstrous assertion it is, a monstrous thing it is, issuing out of their mouths. They say nothing but a lie. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِلَّمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَىٰ Then maybe you will worry yourself to death, sorrowing after them. Uh, if they do not believe in this message. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَىٰ الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Surely we have made whatever is on earth, an adornment for it, so that we may try them as to which of them is best in deeds. And surely we will make it, or we will make what is on it, barren ground, barren ground, without any herbage. So in these beginning verses, we mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises, or we Allah is to be praised for the revelation of the Qur'an. We praise Allah because He gave us the Qur'an. We praise Allah first and foremost because He is Allah, as we talked about last week. But also because He gave us His great blessing of the Qur'an. This great blessing of the perfect book from Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, His very word. And the opening verses talk about some of the reasons why this Qur'an was revealed. That he may warn of a severe punishment coming from him. That he may warn of a severe punishment coming from him. And to give glad tidings of, to the believers who work righteous deeds, that they will have an excellent reward in which they will live forever. وَيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا And to warn those who say that Allah has taken a son. So here Allah mentions three reasons behind 
three of the many reasons behind the revelation of the Quran. What are these reasons? Who can repeat them to me? To warn against severe punishment, coming not just any old punishment, but punishment coming from Allah Himself, Subhanahu wa Taala. And glad tidings of excellent reward to those who do who have iman and work righteous deeds and and to warn those who say that Allah has taken a son so we just, this is the verse we stopped at last week and this is where we're going to continue today وَيُنْذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا and to warn those who say that Allah has taken a son when you're warning somebody of something Okay, in any language, when you warn somebody, there's somebody you're warning, and there's something you're warning them about. Okay, so I'm going to warn you about a punishment. So I'm warning you about what the punishment to come. So when I look, when we look to these to these three verses, which talk about the reasons for the Quran, لِيُنْذِرَ <laughs> to warn of a severe punishment coming from him. What's missing from this verse? Who? The who is missing from this verse? Who is Allah warning? Allah is saying to warn of a severe punishment coming from Allah. But who, who is Allah warning? It's not mentioned. Okay. And to warn those who say that Allah has taken a son. What's missing from this verse? Yeah. The punishment. So who is mentioned in this verse but the what is not mentioned? To warn those who say Allah has taken a son. The who is mentioned, but the what is not mentioned. The previous verse, the what is mentioned, punishment, but the who is not mentioned. And they say that this is an example of the conciseness of the Quran, the, the pithiness or the brevity of the Quran. In that, it mentions what needs to be mentioned. And it leaves out what doesn't need, uh, doesn't need to be mentioned at all. It doesn't have any superfluous words in it. And we fill in the gaps with the first verse and the third verse, with a verse in between. The verse in between says, We are Bashir meaning to give glad tidings to the believers that they have a great reward. They have a great reward. So when we contrast this verse to the verse before, which says to warn of a severe punishment, when you contrast it, we understand that the people who are being warned are those who are not the believers. Yes? Yep. Yeah. When we contrast it to the verse that comes afterwards, to warn those who take the, say that Allah has taken a son, we learn that these people do not have a good reward, an excellent reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have the opposite, they have a severe punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the verse in between actually fills in the gaps for the verse before and the verse after. Okay? Is that, does that make sense? And as I said, this is an example of the pithiness of the Qur'an they mention. It shows that the Qur'an mentioned the wordings of the Qur'an and its wordings, they're exactly what they're meant to be. There's nothing superfluous in the Qur'an, nothing additional. Now another question. When Allah says, That He's going to warn them, of a severe punishment, or the Quran warns of a severe punishment coming from him. The this covers, as we said, the people who are not believers, the people who are disbelievers. Included in the disbelievers is who? Those who commit shirk, those who say that Allah has taken a son. Yeah? Those who say that Allah has taken a child. So now if they're already included in this general statement. Why did Allah mention it again straight after the verse about the believers? And to warn those who say that Allah has taken a son. Why mention it again? They're already covered in the previous verse. Do you, do you understand the question? Emphasis. Emphasis. To emphasize. But what are we emphasizing? Lie the, against Allah. Sorry? A lie. Yeah. We're emphasizing the severity of the belief of this particular group of people. The how we're emphasizing how depraved, how vile it is 
to claim that Allah has taken a child, to claim that Allah SWT has taken a son. So or, even though they're mentioned already as being recipients of a severe punishment from Allah SWT, Allah specifically singles this group of people out of the disbelievers and says, out of the disbelievers, the worst type are those who would ascribe a son or a child to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a God besides Allah. These people, as we know, who are they? They're first and foremost are the pagans. The pagans that were at the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they believed that Allah had daughters. They believed that Allah had daughters. This surah you mentioned is a Meccan surah. So the recipient, the primary recipient would be the pagans of Mecca. They believed that Allah had daughters who were the angels. And of course the Jews and the Christians. The Christians believe that Isa Islam, is the son of God. The Jews, a sect of them believe that Uzair was the son of God. <coughs> so all of these types of people, anybody who believes that Allah has taken a child is covered by this verse. Allah mentions, وَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ شُرَكَاءَ الْجِنَّةِ وَخَلَقَهُمْ وَخَرَقُوا لَهُ بَنِينَ وَبَنَاتٍ بِغَيْرِ الْعِلْمِ They make the jinn partners with Allah, though He created them. And without any true knowledge, they attribute sons and daughters to Him. سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ Glory be to Him. Far above is He of what they ascribe to Him. بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ he is the originator of the heavens and the earth. Anna yakunu lahu walad. How could he have children? Walam takullahu sahiba. When he has no spouse. Wa khalaka kulla shay. And he created everything. Wa huwa bi kulli shayin alim. He has full knowledge of everything. So to warn those specifically who say that Allah has taken a son. Ma lahum bihi min ilmin wala li abaihim. They have no knowledge of this whatsoever. Not them, and neither their fathers, their forefathers, neither their predecessors. They have no knowledge of this, and neither do their predecessors. This kufr of theirs is not based on knowledge. This disbelief, this belief of theirs, which is disbelief, is not based upon knowledge. It's just based upon doubt and speculation or mere concoction. وَمَنْ يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر لا بُرْحَانَ لَهُ بِهِ فَإِنَّمَا حِسَابُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّي Whoever supplicates to a God besides Allah, a God for which he has no evidence at all, will face his reckoning with his Lord. A God for which he has no evidence at all, will face his reckoning with his Lord. They have no knowledge of this. When we negate knowledge, it's either one of two things. Either we say, there is some knowledge there, and you, but you don't have it. Or we mean, there's no knowledge there whatsoever, and therefore you can't have it. Which one do we, which meaning is meant here? Either we say, there is some knowledge there, but you don't have it, you're ignorant of it. Or we say, there's no knowledge there full stop, and therefore you cannot have any of it. Yes. Second the second one, why? Um. Because the first one would imply that there is a justification for taking a God besides Allah somewhere. It's just they don't have it with them. The second meaning is what's meant here. There is no justification. There can be no justification. And therefore you cannot have any knowledge about this whatsoever. So you have no knowledge about this. Why? Because there is no foundation for this belief. There's no foundation whatsoever for this belief. There's no, there's no evidence for this belief. There's no proof. There's no reasoned analysis you can bring that can prove to me that there is a God besides Allah, or that Allah has taken a child. وَلَا لِأَبَائِهِمْ And neither their fathers, nor their predecessors. One of the most common justifications for falsehood, for people being on falsehood, is the claim that this is what our parents did. This is what our forefathers did. We've been doing it for years and years, decades and decades, centuries, generation after generation. We've been doing this. Who are you to come and tell us that this is wrong? Yeah, this is a very common justification. Allah is saying here that neither do you have any knowledge about this or can you have any knowledge about this and neither do any of your predecessors have any justification for this, any knowledge for this. They would say, بَلْ قَالُوا إِنَّا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا عَلَىٰ أُمَّةٍ وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ مُهْتَدُونَ 
They say, we saw our, forf- our fathers following this tradition, and we are guided by their footsteps. This, is where just, this was their justification. Allah is saying, no, your fathers didn't have any knowledge either. Your fathers had no proof either. <coughs> they had no justification either for this belief. So if our predecessors have no proofs for this or evidence for this, then they are not worthy of being followed in this. This is the conclusion of this argument. Your argument is our fathers followed, had this, were upon this belief. Our response, they have no proof for this. They had no evidence for this. They, were, they, were, they had concocted it. If this is the case, they're not worthy of being followed in this belief. And a great benefit for us, a very important benefit from us from this verse. And that is that our knowledge about Allah is entirely received. Is entirely received. Meaning by this that when we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can only speak about Him in a way that we have received. And we can only receive something from Allah, about Allah, from Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the only two sources we have to speak about Allah. We can't make things up. We can't speak about Him without a knowledge basis, without an evidence basis, without a basis of revelation. So our knowledge about Allah is entirely received. We receive it. It's a one-way direction. It's not two ways. It's a one-way direction. It comes from Allah, and we just receive it and accept it. It comes from His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We just receive it and we accept it. We don't reciprocate and start making things up about Allah. We don't reciprocate and start making things up about His religion. And one of the greatest sins possible, in fact, the greatest sin possible, the greatest sin possible, uh, as Ibn Qayyim argues, is to speak about Allah without knowledge. It's to speak about Allah without knowledge. To make things up about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّ الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطْنِ That Allah say, my Lord forbids disgraceful deeds, be they open or hidden, وَالْإِثْمَ وَالْبَغِي And sin and unjustified aggression. وَأَن تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا And that you, without his sanction, associate things with him. وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And that you say things about him without knowledge. This verse mentions three things, and, it, and each thing increases in severity as you go along. The first sin, disgraceful deeds, open or hidden, and unjustified ag- ag- aggression and sin. The next sin, the greatest next in severity, shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last thing mentioned in this verse, the greatest in severity, to speak about Allah without knowledge. Why? Because shirk itself arises from speaking about Allah without knowledge. Shirk, the source of shirk is ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The source of shirk is making things up about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the greatest sin, Ibn al-Qayyim argues based upon this verse, the greatest sin is to make things up about Allah, to speak about Allah without knowledge, waliyadu billah. So, وَيُنذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدَ To warn those who say that Allah has taken a son. To warn those who say that Allah has taken a son. Allah did not say to warn the disbelievers who say that Allah has taken a son. He said to warn those who say that Allah has taken a son. He didn't mention the fact that they're disbelievers. And some of the scholars mention a very interesting point here as to why Allah did not specifically mention their title in this ayah. Like he did in the previous verse. The previous verse says, وَيُبَشِّرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Give glad tidings to the believers. He mentions the believers explicitly. Here he doesn't mention disbelievers. And they said the reason behind this is because this belief is so obvious that it's disbelief, you don't need to mention the fact that they're disbelievers. It's obvious to anybody that this belief is a belief of disbelief. So if somebody was to come to me and say, I believe that Allah has taken a son, I don't need to question any further, that man is a kafir, that person is a kafir. If someone says, I believe there's a God besides Allah, I don't need to question any further, that person is a disbeliever. There's no doubt about this whatsoever. So Allah doesn't have to mention the fact that they're disbelievers. The person, the believer will know straight away that anybody who says, Allah has taken a son, is a disbeliever, is a kafir. Allah goes on to say about this belief. كَبُرَتْ كَلِمَةً تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ 
إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا This is a vile, monstrous assertion. It's a vile, disgusting, monstrous belief, statement coming from their mouths. كَبُوا تَخْرُجُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا They only say a lie. They're speaking lies. There's no truth to this whatsoever. Kaburat, monstrous assertion, grave. The word kabura in Arabic, it means it's used to describe a physical object that's large. Kabir, it's big. And metaphorically, it's used to show something as great, metaphorically, meaning great praiseworthy or great blameworthy. And here, of course, it's being used to show the level of depravity of this belief. So it's great in blameworthiness. It's a severe, monstrous assertion. <coughs> and Allah doesn't say that this is just an evil statement. He says it's coming out of their mouths. They have the audacity to even say this thing. They don't just, they don't just keep this belief, this vile belief in their hearts. They go one step further. They have the audacity to actually articulate the statement on their tongues. That Allah has taken a son. And he says, he doesn't just stop there. Not just the fact that he had the audacity to say it. He stresses one thing. Min afwahihim. That this statement is coming out of their mouths. Okay, when you say a statement, it's obvious it's going to come from your mouth, right? So why mention, we mentioned in the, in the beginning of this class, that Allah doesn't mention any words that are superfluous in the Quran. So when I say that, I said a statement. It's obvious to everybody it's going to come out of my mouth. So why would Allah stress the fact that it's coming out of their mouths here? Why would Allah make a point of saying this statement is coming out of their mouths? Is that question clear? What's the point of saying? Does it assert they're blameworthy? Because they, it's a witness against them. So they, they come, it's a word that they, it's not just a word, they actually make the effort. Okay, that's a, that's a good point that it's, it serves as a witness against them. That's not the only reason yet. Yeah. Does it show like, um, the importance of God in their lives in saying uh, things about Nabi? Uh, there is a point about the, the fact that we should try to keep our tongues clean and pure, especially when it comes to the belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but that's not what's being really stressed here. Now, is it that not only is it in the heart, but then it's raised to the tongue so that they have the audacity to, to, to um, Yeah, so they've had the audacity to articulate it, um, but also they said that the point of stressing that is coming from their mouths. In today's terminology, we would say, in, in modern terminology, we would say it's just hot air. It's just hot air. It's empty, meaningless words. You're blurting things out without any thought. Yeah, that's what's being stressed here. That this belief it's just hot air. You're just blurting it out. There's no thought behind it. There's no reasoned conclusion of well thought out, rational, reasoned, evidence based conclusion process that has led them to conclude this statement. It's just something that blurts out of their mouth. Yeah. Effectively, it has no weight whatsoever. That's what's being stressed here. The point of saying that this statement is coming out of their mouths, it's just hot air. Empty words, having no weight whatsoever. It's being blurted out without any forethought. And it cannot have any forethought. There cannot be any true justification for, for this belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالُتَّ In Surah Al-Maryam, وَقَالُتَّ خَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَ They say that Ar-Rahman, the Lord of Mercy, has taken a son. لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْءً إِدَّ You have come with a monstrosity. You have said a monstrosity, an evil statement. تَكَادُ السَّمَاوَاتُ يَتَفَطَّرْنَ مِنْهُ The heavens are almost split apart at this statement. And the earth is almost cleaved asunder. And the mountains are almost falling down in dust, crumbling in dust. And they could have the audacity to claim that Ar Rahman has taken a son. And it is not befitting for Allah to take a son. إِنْ يَقُولُونَ إِلَّا كَذِبًا They say nothing but a lie. They're saying nothing but a lie. So, when we investigate these two verses about the, the belief of taking a son, Allah taking a son, 
We find that Allah has warned these people in three ways or three different levels. First, He starts telling them, He starts by telling them what? They have no knowledge about this. There's no evidence based reasoning that could lead to this conclusion. Where is your evidence? You have no evidence. So, this is the first level of Allah trying to open the eyes of these people. Where's your evidence? You have no evidence for this. Then Allah tells them, what you are saying is actually vile, it's disgusting, it's filthy. It's not befitting that Allah take a son. It's not befitting that you hold a belief like this about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not only do you have, not, have no evidence, the next level, these are filthy words coming out of your mouth. And then the third thing, the third level, Allah emphasizes this by saying, you are lying. In yakuluna illa kadiba. You're lying. There's no truth to the statement whatsoever. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, none is more patient than Allah against blasphemous words that he hears. They ascribe children to him, yet he bestows upon them health and provision. They claim that he has children, they insult him, they say blasphemous statements, yet he still, despite this, he gives them health and provision. And now we turn the, the, the ayah, the beginning of the surah turns to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفًا Then maybe you will worry yourself to death, sorrowing or in sorrow after them, if they do not believe in this message. If they do not believe in this message. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئٌ the word bakhir, it means to die from depression. It's a very strong word. It means to die from depression. You get so sad, so depressed, so despondent that you die. And this is why Ibn Abbas, he said, it means that you're going to kill yourself. You're going to end up causing, your own, causing harm to yourself. And others said, you're going to worry yourself to death. Then maybe you will worry yourself to death. عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ آثار. آثار literally means traces or footprints and there's an imagery being given here they said and the, this imagery is that somebody's turned around and left you and has left footprints in the sand and you're following those footprints okay you're following those footprints or the imagery is when a person leaves his house if I was to leave my house and move, move away, the things I leave behind in that house would be called athar. They're the effects I've left behind me. And so the imagery again is somebody of a, a beloved person who's left his house and you, remind, and you go to his house and look at his athar, his, the things he's left behind, and you're being reminded about him and you're, and you're feeling sorrow for that person. And both of these are, this imagery is really what's meant here. The imagery is of, of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feeling saddened that they have left him, abandoned the message that he came with. They've abandoned his message. And walking after them, they've turned away, they've walked away from him. They've turned their backs to him. And he's walking after them, calling them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِلَّمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَادَ الْحَدِيثِ Because they don't, they don't believe in this message, in this Qur'an. Why is he sorrow? Why is he despondent? Why is he saddened? It's not because they've rejected him as a person. It's not because they've turned away from him as a person. It's because they rejected the truth. They rejected Allah and his message. They rejected the Quran. This is why he is sad. This is why he is sad. He is saddened at the rejection of the truth. So many people when they call to Islam, so many people when they call to the truth, they end up really calling to themselves. You know, it's more like an ego trip for themselves. They're trying to get uh, some sort of status in the eyes of people. This is not the way of the Messenger Islam. He wasn't concerned about himself. He wasn't concerned about making money. He wasn't concerned about getting status. He wanted people genuinely and sincerely to believe in the Quran. And when they didn't, he felt saddened by the fact that they, reject, they rejected the truth. They rejected the truth and walked and turned away from it. And this is a great lesson for all of us. That we are meant to be people who are concerned about the people around us. The, disbelievers, the believers and the disbelievers. We are concerned about the people around us. We want the good for everybody. 
like our Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. We want the good for everybody. We want the good for our brothers and sisters in Islam. We want the good for the non-Muslims around us. We want them to accept Islam. And when they reject Islam, we don't gloat and say, you people of hellfire, you're going to burn in hell. And gloat about it. That's not the way of Islam. That's not the sunnah of a messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Our concern should lead us to be sorrow, uh, sorrow uh, feel sorry for them, feel saddened at the fact that they've rejected the truth. Out of our concern for these people. Out of our sincere desire that they accept the truth. Not us. We don't matter at all at the end of the day. Uh, that they accept the truth itself. So the point of this verse is really to tell the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or rather to prohibit him from not, not being sad, this is the natural human reaction, but this extreme sadness he was feeling. This, 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 um, the depth of grief he was feeling at the rejection of his people. Allah is effectively saying don't go to that level, don't go to that length because you'll end up uh, causing harm to yourself. This grief might consume you. Don't go to this level. Feel sad, fine. But not to the point where the grief will consume you altogether. So this verse is effectively teaching the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and us by extension that our duty is just to convey. Our duty is just to convey the message of Islam to the people and guidance and to try our best in doing so. To try our best and to be persistent in doing so as well. But guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who chooses who accepts guidance and who does not accept guidance. So if people reject the call, it's not in our hands in the first place. Okay, we might feel saddened for them, and we should feel saddened for them, but not to the point where we start feeling suicidal, for example, yeah? going to the, being consumed with grief. Because guidance at the end of the day is Allah's matter, it's not our matter. What's a really important, actually a really interesting point here, something for us to really think about. This verse, what's happened here is we have the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa calling to Islam. And we have the Quraysh rejecting him, the pagans rejecting him and turning him turning away in disbelief. Yeah, they, they end up, they walk away as disbelievers. But look at who Allah is addressing in this verse. Who is Allah addressing in this verse? Who is Allah addressing in this verse? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He's not even concerned. The Quraysh for the disbelief doesn't even, doesn't even come into the equation here. Allah is concerned about his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah is showing solicitude to his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Allah is more concerned about the grief that he is feeling than the disbelief that Quraysh have actually fallen into. The disbelief that Quraysh fell into is their choice. They chose disbelief and turned away and they walked away. Allah is not concerned that that's their choice, finished with it, their job's done. Allah is concerned about the grief that the Messenger Muhammad is feeling at this point and is telling him, don't go to this level. Don't feel this grief to this level. It shows us the concern and solicitude that Allah shows towards his Messenger. Not just in this verse, but in many, many verses of the Qur'an. That Allah repeatedly shows concern for the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Showing us, therefore, that if Allah is showing concern for him, we too should do the same thing. Love, respect, honor, following, all of these we have to have as part of our faith, the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. It's telling us the status of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. That Allah feels concern for him. Allah is showing concern for the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. The status, the great status of our, of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Telling us also that whoever is upon Allah's path, whoever is upon the Messenger of Allah's path, calling to Islam, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ This is my path, I call to Allah upon sure knowledge, those in, I and those who follow me. Whoever is upon the path of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah will also be concerned with that person as well. Allah will also care his rububiyyah, his, his lordship will come to that person. Allah will cherish him with that specific rububiyyah that he reserves for his believers, for his servants.
The next verse, Inna ja'alna ma'ala al-ardi zinatan laha linabaluwa hum ayyuhum ahsanu amala. Surely we have made whatever is on earth an adornment for it, a zina, so that we may test them as to which of them is best in deeds. Balwa, lina baluwa hum balwa, to test, to examine out of experience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tabaraka alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. That blessed is the one in whose hand is the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He is powerful over everything. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ He created life and death. لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ أَمَلًا That he may test you as to which of you is best indeed. This verse is also a... This verse is actually a consolation to the Messenger. The previous verse is talking about how the Messenger was aggrieved. Or grieved at the rejection of the pagans. In this verse, Allah is consoling the Messenger. He is saying that what's made these people reject is they're clinging onto this dunya, is they're clinging onto this world. They want the money, they want the status, they want the provision, they want the riches, they want the easy, good life in this world. But the reality of this world is it's a test, it's a transient thing, it's temporary. You're going to pass through it, it's a test. And everything on it is just an adornment. It's not permanent, it's an adornment. Like every adornment, if you think about clothes, if you think about jewelry we wear, clothes we wear, they're called they're types of adornment. The jewelry that women wear, types of adornment, they all wear away. They all wear away, they eventually got fade and disappear. Allah is saying everything on the surface of zina, it will eventually fade and disappear. It's going to disappear, that's the reality of this world. So these people... They failed the test of the world. They failed the test. They lusted after the world, they lived for the world, they clung to the world. But the reason why we have given, put the zina on this world, the reason why we put the world here, is to test you as to which of you uh, is the best indeed. Which of you is the best indeed? To test which of you is best indeed. It's very important. There's a very important point to note here. And that point is that Allah did not say to test which of you has the most deeds. Allah said which of you has the best deeds. So what's important here is the quality of the deed, not the quantity of the deed. What, we, what Allah is looking to, for, from us or uh, looking to us for is quality of deed. Not quantity. A person could pray a hundred rakahs in a day of nafu prayer. And somebody could pray two nafu prayers. And those two could be far, far greater and better with in sight of Allah than a hundred. A person could, could give a million pounds in zakat. Another could give in, in sadaqah. Another could give one pound in sadaqah. And that one pound could be better in the sight of Allah than a million pounds. Why? Because of the quality of that deed. That sincerity behind that deed. The sacrifice that a person went through in, in, in doing that deed. So Allah wants from us quality. He doesn't necessarily want from us quantity. And that's why the Salaf said that they, the meaning of this ayah is in terms of the best deed. What is the best deed? It's the best, the deed which is a deed which is not arising from uh, being deceived by the dunya. It's a, it's a deed which is azhad, most ascetic. Are you not being deceived by the dunya? You're not doing it for the dunya at all. You're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the deed which is the most sincere. It's a deed which is the most correct. Meaning by correct what? What does correct mean here? When I say a deed is correct, what does that mean? Aligned to the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So deeds, the best deed is a deed that is done sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aligned to the sunnah of our messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam. Done in the way taught to us by our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِنَّ لَجَاءِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا سَعِيدًا جُرُّزًا And most surely, we will make it, we'll make what is on it a barren ground. No herbage whatsoever. A whole land which is barren. 
This world will go away. As Ibn Abbas on whom I said, the meaning of this ayah, everything on this earth will, dis- will be destroyed. He will leave it as a fat, flat plain. In it he will see no valley or hill. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make everything on this earth barren, a flat plain. He will destroy everything on this earth. And then a judgment day will begin. Allah has a power. Allah is the omnipotent. He can grant, he can take away. He grants the adornment of this world and he can take it all away as well. Now two of the greatest aspects of the fitna of the Dajjal is to do with this world and misguiding people away from the truth. These are two aspects of the fitna of the Dajjal. This world and to guide people away from the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that this world is a zina, it's an adornment. And if you look at the, if you look at the hadith about the Dajjal, we find that at his time, what some of the miracles he will do is that he will make the world fine, finer than it has ever been for those who follow him. For those who follow him, finer, finer than it has ever been for those who follow him. But Allah is saying that this world is a zina; it will disappear. So no matter what the Dajjal promises of this dunya, it's all transient, it's temporary. It has no real permanence to it at all. It has no real value to it at all. The value lies in the hereafter. What the other aspect is misguiding people away from the truth. By the dunya again. The dunya is a greater source for this. Again, Allah is telling us, don't be deceived by the dunya here. Don't let your anger or the stress at things in this world distract you from the reality. Don't let... The fact that you have a, dis- a grievance of, in, in the world distract you and let you uh, become unjust or to deceive you away from the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't let the dunya deceive you in any way. Don't let the world deceive you in any way. In these verses, in these verses, these eight verses, there's a lot of uh, benefit for us, lots of points of benefit for us. We learn from these verses, these eight verses, that the greatest blessing that Allah has given us is the revelation of the Qur'an and the sending of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And because this is the greatest blessing and Allah tells us in these verses that this Qur'an is consistent, it's perfect, it's balanced, it's a miracle and the fact that it warns and it gives glad tidings, it shows us, it tells us that we must Maintain a connection to this book <coughs> There's no point in Allah telling us That it's a bless- the greatest blessing that Allah has given us That it's a miracle That it's straight and perfect and balanced And it gives you guidance There's no point in Allah telling us all of these things If we are just to ignore it We must maintain our connection to this book We must There's no two ways about it Recite it, study it, understand it Implement it in our lives And when we do this, we will find that the Qur'an will become the solution to all our problems. Our connection to the Qur'an, our belief in the Qur'an, our following the Qur'an will be the solution to all of our problems. There's no doubt about this whatsoever. This is a reality. It will be the solution to all our problems. These verses show us, as we talked about last week, that iman and good deeds have to go hand in hand. You can't just claim to have iman and not do good deeds. Allah has promised the reward of paradise to who? To who? In these, in these verses believers. Not just the believers Believers who do good deeds Allah has promised paradise to the believers Who do good deeds Both things have to go together Iman with good deeds Which is why some of the scholars they said It's actually impossible It's actually impossible to imagine That somebody has Iman True Iman in his heart And it doesn't result in any deeds Any good deeds It's an impossible situation they said when Iman takes root in our hearts, in the heart of a believer, it must, as a nece- out of necessity, it must result in good deeds. 
There must be some good deeds coming. It might be a, the person might have weak iman. But something must be there of good deeds. And they said that if a person claims to have iman, a person claims to have belief, but in his entire life doesn't do a single good deed, that person we can say with certainty was never a Muslim. That person we can say with certainty was never a believer. Iman, he was lying when he said Iman has entered my heart. Because it's impossible, it's an impossibility to, that Iman not result in deeds. Iman, this is what Ibn Taymiyyah's words, Iman not result in deeds. So Iman and good deeds must go hand in hand. We learn from these verses that paradise is truly a great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a great reward. We learn from these verses that the Qur'an warns against those who reject belief. And it highlights the depravity of claiming that Allah is true children. And that there is no possible basis in knowledge for such a claim. We learn about the severity of lying against Allah in these verses. Making things, about, things up about his religion. We learn about this, the severity of speaking without knowledge of Allah's religion. We learn about the concerns that a da'i should have. That he should be concerned for his people. He should be concerned and want the best for the people he's calling to. We learn that the one who is on Allah's path, Allah is concerned with him. Allah shows his rububiyyah to that person. So again, if I'm facing fitan, if I'm facing trials and tribulations, if I'm facing difficulties, what better way of getting out of them than having Allah being concerned with me? Allah is showing a specific rububiyyah to me, my, myself personally. How do I do this? Stay on Allah's path. So what's the solution for the fit and stay on Allah's path? Allah will reciprocate by showing his concern and solicitude to that individual himself. May Allah make us amongst those people. We learn from these verses, don't be deceived by this world. Don't be deceived by this dunya. It's just a test. This world is just temporary. We, should we, we live in this world without a doubt. We earn our money without a doubt. We can be rich if we want to. There's no problem with this in, in Islam whatsoever. But don't be deceived by this world. Don't live for this world. Concentrate on the hereafter, the permanent, the real, the hereafter. <coughs> we, these verses, they talk about the importance of Tawheed, the belief in oneness of Allah. They talk about the importance of Risala, the messengership, and about the scriptures, the revelation of scriptures, and about the Akhirah, the hereafter. All of these must be part and parcel of our belief. We learned, as we, as we discussed last, last, um, last session, that Iman, true belief, we talked about success, comes when Iman and good deeds go together. But Iman itself must be built upon love, hope and fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we learned these also from these ayat. Who knows what Ephesus is? Place called Ephesus. It's in Turkey. It's in modern day Turkey. And looking to the Roman martyr martyrology or the concordance of saints of the Roman Catholic Church, they say that Ephesus is the location at which the holy sleepers lie. The holy sleepers. Uh, resting in peace, awaiting the day of resurrection, as they say. So according to Christian tradition, or the Roman Catholic Church tradition, around the year 250 AD, Christianity was facing persecution from a king called uh, Decius. And seven young men were accused of having accepted the Christian faith. And they were given time to recant their belief and return to the pagan beliefs uh, of that time. But they chose instead to stick to their belief in Christianity. They ran away from oppression. They left their worldly possessions behind. They left everything behind. They ran away and they hid in a cave. In that cave, they prayed and they meditated. And a dog followed them, these seven sleepers, these seven people, and sat itself at the, at the mouth of this cave. The people, these seven people, while they were meditating, they fell asleep. The dog fell asleep as well. The king, Decius, searched for these people and found them in this cave. And he ordered as a punishment that rather than waking them up, seal the cave up. Seal this cave up and they'll be 
trapped in there forever. So the cave is uh, sealed up and some of their fellow Christians came and they inscribed their names on, 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 on this cave. And then we skip forward two centuries by this story. And we have the reign of Theodos Theodosius II. <coughs> so during the reign here, a landowner, he finds this cave. He decides, okay, this is, I can use the rocks here for my own building. <coughs> I can use this for, for storage. So he takes away, he starts removing the rocks from the mouth of the cave. And when he does this, inside the seven sleepers wake up. So having, rather than having died, they've been sleeping all this time. And they wake up. <coughs> By this time, it's this two centuries later, Christianity has become the state religion. And but what's happening at this time in Christianity is that they're having a big debate amongst themselves about resurrection. Is it bodily? Is it spiritual? Does it really happen or not? Christianity is debating about itself. So these people wake up and they feel hungry, so they go and they try looking for food. And when they go looking for food, they find all these buildings, they've got a cross on them, openly displaying the cross. And they're astounded. And the people around them also astounded. These people coming out and they're wearing clothes that are two centuries old. And they're speaking a dialect of language which is centuries, it's died out. So they're shocked. So the local bishop is summoned, he interviews them, he tells a story, they, they tell their story. And after they've told their story, they praise God and they pass away. And this apparently finished the debate about the resurrection, because the resurrection had been proven in this, in this miraculous event. The emperor at that time, he wants to build a golden tomb over the graves, or over the graves of these, of these um, sleepers. But they appear in a dream, and they ask that they want to be buried in their cave. So they're buried in their cave, and eventually a church is built over this, uh, this cave. And the Christians start taking these people as intermediaries. They start praying to them. They start take, asking them for forgiveness of their sins. They start taking them as intermediaries with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they want to be buried around. And people start getting buried around the cave. Because they believe barakah, blessings will come into their graves. As a result of being buried next to these, to these individuals. So, in 1927, it said, they say that the, this, the, this grotto, the ruins of the church in this cave were excavated and they found hundreds and hundreds of graves lying around there. And the Roman Catholic art, uh, uh, script, books mentioned the fact, the story of the sleepers of a cave and they, and they linked the two together. This is actually the most famous source of the sleepers of the cave, outside of Islam, obviously. I mean, the most famous story is linked to this event in, in 250 AD in, the Christ, uh, in Christian history. And most in the world today, most uh, stories about the sleepers of a cave will mention this story uh, mentioned, uh, that I've just talked about in brief here. But actually, when, when, I, when I studied about the source of this story, when I was reading up about it, you find that actually um, versions of the story exist in different cultures and nations throughout history. It's not just existing amongst Christianity. So Aristotle, for example, he died in 322 BC. He talks about a story about the sleepers of a cave. He talks about the sleepers of a cave as well. There's also Indian versions to the story. And of course, there's Jewish versions of the story. Now, What's important for us is the Qur'an also mentions the story, Sleepers of the Cave. But the Qur'an doesn't mention, or none of the hadith, the Qur'an and the hadith don't mention about who these people were. They don't mention about when these people were. They don't mention anything about where these people were. And so, uh, some of the scholars, they connected the story that the Christians tell with the story that the Quran tells. And this is not necessarily correct. And one of the reasons that it's not correct is, as Ibn Kathir mentions, that if you look to the, the 
reason why the surah is revealed. Who remember the reason why the surah was revealed? That's a, I mean, that's a lesson we learned. But what's one of the reasons? What 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 was the event that led up, led up to revelation of this particular surah? The Jews asked three questions, and one of those questions were about the sleepers of the cave, for theirs is the wondrous tale. So this is a story known to the Jews. It's a story known to the, to the Jews, okay? And of course, known before, and therefore before Christianity. And the Jews would not be interested in Christian law anyway. Why would the Jews be interested in Christian law? So Ibn Kathir argues that actually the origin of the story is before Christianity. It's actually before Christianity. It's actually perhaps in Judaism itself. The origin of the story. What's important for us is that regardless of where the story is originating from, what's important for us is the, is the, is the lessons we learn from the story. And the fact that the story is true. Because it's mentioned in the Quran, we know for a fact that it's true. And the lessons we learn from the story is what we're going to talk about in the next session. But what I want to, the one lesson I want us to walk away with today about this story is that uh, these young men were not scholars of Islam. They weren't learned people of Islam. They weren't mujahideen who sacrificed themselves in battle for, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were just normal people like you and I. And they were youth. They were young people, like a few, like a, a lot of the young youth sitting around here, who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stood up for that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, in this, this fact was so significant that Allah Himself praises them for this and puts their story in the Quran. Young people who believed in Allah and stood up for that belief. It's such an important fact. Not scholars, normal people. It's such an important fact that Allah puts a story in the Quran. So for us, the youth, we, we're always talking about the youth many times, many ways, and often we talk about them in negative. They've got this problem and that problem, this problem and that problem. But really, if the youth stand up, our, the, the success lies with our youth, really. It's often the youth that will stand up and find the spine and the backbone to stand up against oppression and, and wrongdoing and stand up for their beliefs. And really we have to inculcate in our, in our youth, our, ourselves and also our youth, the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will be them inshallah who will stand up for that belief and promote that belief and put that belief forward. The hope for us lies in our younger generations. The hope for us going forward lies in our younger generations. And this is an important lesson for us we learn from this, from this ayah, from this ayat. These were young people who just believed, simple guys, simple people who just believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stood up for that belief. They wanted to preserve that belief. They abandoned everything for that belief, as we learn next week. And Allah talks about them in the Quran. Allah put that story in the Quran. And with that, inshallah, we'll stop for today. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you repeat that? So, this course will actually stop for the next three weeks. We'll be starting the winter program in WISE. So for the next three Fridays, we'll be having talks on Fridays, inshallah. And then we'll continue this um, in four weeks' time, inshallah.